Hello students, today we will discuss Lee Hunt's essay, Getting Up on Cold Mornings. Lee Hunt made a name for himself as poet, critic, journalist, editor and essayist. But he was probably best and best known in his own time as an essayist. As Hunt noted in a letter, even his friends thought he was superior at writing essays. And as J.B. Priestley pointed out, had Hunt not worked side by side with Lamb and Hazlitt, he might have enjoyed a greater reputation as an essayist. James Thompson suggests the general quality of his periodical writing was surprisingly high. Considering the bulk, Hunt wrote at least three distinct kind of essays, critical, political, and familiar. His first essays, those published in The Traveler in 1804, over the signature of Mr. Town, Critique and Censor General, were critical. In 1805 to 1807, he published a number of articles of dramatic criticism in the news and of course the examiner printed many critical and political articles over the years when Hunt was editor. But the kind of essays that Hunt was master of, perhaps no one in the 19th century other than Lamb, Lamb, Charles Lamb, wrote better ones were the familiar essays. Many of them appeared in journals of which he was editor. Reflector, Indicator, Liberal, Companion, Tatler, these are some of the name of the journals. Lee Hunt's London General and Lee Hunt's General from 1850-51. He also published essays in many other journals, but the best of his familiar essays appeared in the Indicator, Companion and Lee Hunt's London General. The topic of the familiar essays were wide-ranging. No other contemporary essays wrote on so many themes. As his son, Thornton noted, few essays have equaled or approached Lee Hunt in the combined versatile versat Sorry, versatility, invention, and finish off his miscellaneous prose writing. He wrote about various activities from dancing to pig driving of people, ancient and contemporary, real and imaginary of everyday life, of holidays, of places from Pisa to St. Paul's, of windows and sticks. He wrote character sketches of old men, old women, meet servants and washerwomen. He told stories, but mostly he wrote about nature. Hot days, cold days, rainy days, May days, spring days, and autumn, daisies, and peasants, and literature, poetry, and poets, drama, and dramatist. So there are variety of themes in his essays. One distinctive feature of all the familiar essays is that, as Louis Landry wrote, Lee Hunt is always present in his essays, more openly than Hajwit in his. Whether he comments about what he describes or recollects, makes a share in his sentiments and beliefs, or discusses movements of his own life or, express, or expresses his views on people, he has been acquainted with this is different from the traditional 18th century essay, which was Hunt's model. In the 18th century, essayist used a spokesman or persona. Perhaps Hunt developed the trait from the essays he wrote in his letters, where he was of course writing in his own person, being something of a child prodigy. Hunt apparently was always able to write a finished first draft. This is evident from his letters, which all maintain a high level of writing and yet few of them seems to have been rewritten and corrections are relatively rare. Indeed, parts of many of the letters could have been published as essays. The ability to write rapidly and well certainly contributed both to his success as journalist and as an essayist. 
who was constantly forced to write for money. But the essays in the letters, as they may be called, contain various notable characteristics found in Hunt's published essays, such as descriptions of places, character sketches, anecdotes, and narratives. A comparison between passages from early letters and from later published essays demonstrates their similarity of technique and mode. There are many merits in his essays, but Hunt is no doubt at his best in his humorous descriptive essay, such as Getting Up on Cold Mornings. In this essay, he describes and rationalizes his reluctance to get out of bed on a cold morning. Getting up on cold morning. An Italian author, Giulio Crodra, a Jesuit, has written a poem upon insects, which he begins by insisting that those troublesome and abominable little animals were created for our annoyance, and that they were certainly not inhabitants of paradise. We of the North may dispute this piece of theology. But on the other hand, it is clear as the snow on the housetops that Adam was not under the necessity of shaving and that when Eve walked out of a delicious bowl, she did not step upon ice three inches thick. Some people say it is very easy thing to get up of a cold morning. You have only, they tell you to take the resolution and the thing is done. This may be very true, just as a boy at school has only to take a flogging and the thing is over, but we have not at all made up our minds upon it and we find it a very pleasant experience to discuss the matter candidly. Before we get up, this at least is not idly. Though it may be like, it affords an excellent answer to those who ask how lying in bed can be indulged in by a reasoning being being a rational creature. How, why with the argument calmly at work in one's head and the clothes over one's shoulder? Oh, it's a fine way of spending a sensible, impartial half hour. In this essay, Lee Hunt is talking about the pleasure of lying in the bed in a cold morning instead of getting up early in cold mornings. If these people would be more charitable, they would get on with their argument better. But they are apt to reason so ill and to assert so dogmatically that one could wish to have them stand round one's bed of a bitter morning and lie before their faces. They ought to hear both sides of the bed, the inside and the out, if they cannot entertain themselves with their own thoughts for half an hour or so, it is not the fault of those who can. If their will is never pulled aside by the enticing arms of imagination, so much the luckier for the stage coachman. Candid inquiries into one's documency, besides the greater or less privileges to be allowed a man in proportion to his ability of keeping early hours. The work given his faculties, etc., will at least concede their due merits to such representations as the following. In the first place, says the injured but calm appealer, I have been warm all night and find my system in a state perfectly suitable to a warm-blooded animal. To get out of, out of this state into the cold beside the inharmonious and uncritical abruptness of the transition is so unnatural to such a creature that the poets refining upon the tortures of the diamond, making one of their greatest agonies, agonies consist in being suddenly transported from heat to cold, from fire to ice. They are hailed out of their beds says Milton, by harpy-footed furies, fellows who come to call them on my first moment towards the anticipation of getting up, I find that such part of the sheets and bolster as are exposed to the air of the room are stone cold. On opening my eyes, the first thing that meets them in my own breath, rolling forth as if in the open air like smoke out of a cottage chimney, 
think of this symptom. Then I turn my eyes sideways and see the window all frozen over. Think of that. Then the serpent comes. Here, I'm just talking about a man's experience while he's lying in the bed in the cold morning. He, he does not want to come out of it because he feels that it is like a uh, hellish torture. He feels as if somebody has given a punishment to him. And when a servant comes to wake him up, he, he feels very much irritated and he doesn't like this state. It's very cold this morning. Is it not very cold, sir? Very cold indeed, isn't it? Very cold indeed, sir. More than usually so, isn't it? Even for this weather, here the servant's wit and good nature are put to considerable test and the inquirer lies on the thrones for the answer. Why, sir? I think it is good creature. There is not a better or more truth-telling servant going. I must rise, however, get me some warm water. Here comes a fine interval between the departure of the servant and the arrival of the hot water. The man who is sleeping in bed, he wants to sleep for a, for a little time. He, he thinks that he should get more time to sleep. He doesn't want to come outside of the bed. During which, of course, it is of no use to get up. The hot water comes. Is it quite hot? Yes, sir. Perhaps too hot for shaving. I must wait a little. No, sir. It will just do. The servant convinces his master, but the master is not ready to come out of bed and to get ready for daily chorus. There is an overnice propriety, sometimes an officious deal of virtue, a little troublesome. Oh, the shirt, you must air my clean shirt. Linen gets very damp this weather. Yes, sir. Here, another delicious five minutes. A knock at the door. Oh, the shirt, very well. My stocking. I think the stocking had better be aired too. Very well, sir. Here, another interval. At length, everything is ready except myself. I now continues our incubant. A happy word, by the by, for a country regard. I now cannot help thinking a good deal. Who can upon the unnecessary and villainous custom of shaving? Here, the writer thinks that shaving in the cold morning is a villainous custom. It's a very torturing experience. It is a thing so unmanly. Here, I nestle closer. So effeminate here, I recoil from an unlucky step into the colder part of the bed. No wonder that the Queen of France took part with the rebels against the dangerous king, her husband, who first affronted her smooth visage with a face like her own. The Emperor Julian never showed the luxuriancy of his genius to better advantage than in reviewing the following beard. Look at Cardinal Bamboo pictures at Michelangelo at title at uh, Titans, at Shakespeare's, at Fletcher's, at Spencer, at Chaucer, at Alfred's, at Plato's. I couldn't name a great man for every tick of watch. Look at the Turks, a grave and Ortiz people. Think of Harun, all Rashi, and Badrid and Hassan. Think of worldly Montagu, the worldly son of mother, a man about the prejudice of his type. Look at the Persian gentleman, whom one is ashamed of meeting about the suburbs. Their dress and appearance are so much finer than our own. Lastly, think of the razor itself, how totally opposed to every sensation of bad, how cold, how agey, how hard, how utterly different from anything like the warm encircling amplitude which sweetly recommends itself unto our gentle senses. In this assay, the writer says that getting up on cold morning and shaving are punishments given to mankind. For Adam and Eve had sinned against God before sinning there, neither had snowy winters nor Adam was compelled to shave. Ways to avoid 
early rising by lazy people. Hans set himself as an example to show the ways to avoid early rising. First of all, he starts an inquiry about the cold weather outside to his servant who has the intention to wake him up. Next, he commands to keep ready all the article and dresser. Then he orders hot water for shaving and he finds excuse on saying that the water is too hot and so he needs some time for the water to cool down. Then at last he had no reason to excuse and so he got up and was ready to shave. He says that shaving is villainous custom since the cold razor is a contrast to warmth. Even Queen Eleanor divorced her husband, King Louis of France, because he had shaved his beard. So he states that beard adds impressive looks to men. Hunt says that Thompson, who accuses a man getting up late, and Thompson himself used to get up at noon, thereby expressing his laziness. So no one could refuse the pleasure of late rising. In the next video, we will discuss about more reasons to get up late and the poet um, arguments regarding pleasure of late rising. Now, uh, you have to do uh, an assignment, write a brief introduction to the author Lee Hunt, which I had already given in the beginning of the lecture. Thank you. In the next class, we will discuss about the remaining essay. Thank you so much.